Hey everyone, how you doing? This is Mr. Mazzaro, and today I want to take a break from talking about plant evolution to talk to you about the most evolutionary, evolutionarily successful group of plants ever to exist, angiosperms, flowering plants. We're going to talk about what makes angiosperms unique among the other th three groups of plants, and we're going to talk about specifically what makes flowering plants so good at sex, because that's really what makes them unique and reproduction. And last, we're going to talk about how botanists take what is, in fact, the largest, most diverse group of living things ever to exist on Earth, and how they divide them up into smaller, more manageable categories to deal with. So, what are angiosperms? They're plants that have vascular tissue, and they produce seeds in flowers. And those flowers can become fruit and the flower is the reproductive structure. The fruit, it, the fruit is defined as the ovary. So see, here you see an apple flower through evolution actually becoming an apple fruit with the seeds on the inside. So originally those seeds would be develop inside here and then a mature inside what is effectively a fruit. And it is both the flower and the fruit that makes angiosperms so successful. They're the first plants to make flowers and seeds in fruit. Why is that an important? Well, number one, flowers have both male and female parts. So not only can they reproduce sexually by transferring pollen or sperm from one flower to another flower, but they also can reproduce asexually by transferring sperm from the male part of one flower to the female part of the same flower. So they don't only have to reproduce sexually, they can also reproduce asexually if there's no other, other flowering plants around. Flowering plants were the first ones to attract individual pollinators, which, again, you remember from the last, the last lesson, is a lot more reliable on wind. Before bees, it was beetles, but it doesn't matter. An insect flying from flower to flower to flower gives a much more targeted fertilization and, and, and allows for a lot larger of a reproductive yield than just wind blowing around your sperm wherever it may go. And last, flowers have a long, shorter life cycle than most plants. Flowering plants have a shorter life cycle than most plants, which allows for more evolution because shorter life cycles means more generations of plants over and over and over again. Last, fruits. Fruits evolve to be eaten, to be carried, to go away. For the first pot, for the first time, not only do plants have a targeted way of becoming fertilized, but they also have a method of carrying their babies as far away from them as possible. Whether this be the head of a dandelion blowing around in the wind, whether it be an apple being eaten by a human and then they chuck the core into the bushes somewhere, whether it be a person eating a watermelon and spitting out the seeds, all of these are fruits, and all of them are fruits that are designed to get their seeds as far away from the parent plant as possible. And this allows the babies to not have to compete with the parent plant for light nutrients. Less competition and further traveling of your children means more potential to evolve and take over more land faster. Not only targeted fertilization with flowers, but then their babies get carried away in the fruit. They're really just reproductively perfect organisms. Flowering plants, these reproductively perfect organisms, become the most diverse group of plants and organisms ever to exist on Earth. And it's been sort of the problem of botanists to come up with really clear ways and really clear way, uh, really clear lines to define and segregate out this largest, most diverse group of organisms ever to exist on Earth into smaller, more manageable categories. And there are certainly more ways than the ways that I'm going to show you, and in some cases, depending on how you're looking at it, better ways than the ways I'm going to show you. But in terms of horticulture, planting seeds and understanding how to grow plants, Plants, plants are usually divided into two categories, monocots and eudicots, otherwise known as dicots. 
monocots, and dicots. And the reason this is used by horniculturalists is because there's a bunch of different ways to look at a flowering plant and determine whether or not it's a monocot or a dicot. For instance, you can look at the seed. Seeds that split into two, like peanuts or like sunflower seeds, they split into two because they have two cotyledons, two sides of a seed that feeds the embryo with food. Versus things like corn or popcorn kernels, coconuts that don't split easily into two. They don't split into two easily into two because they don't have two cotyledons inside their seed. They have one. One cotyledon, one, one meaning mono, monocot, versus two cotyledons, dicot. So seeds split into two, it's a dicot. One of the groups of flowering plants. Seeds don't split into two, it's a monocot. Monocot, dicot, sunflowers. Dicot. The next is looking at the flowers. You can determine whether you're looking at a monocot or a dicot by looking at how many petals a flower has. Monocots have petals in multiples of three. Dicots have petals in multiples of four or five. So looking at this flower, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that would be a monocot. This flower, one, two, three, four, five. Five would make this plant a dicot. One, two, three. This would make this plant a monocot. So not only do you have to look at the seeds, but you can also look at the flowers. You don't only have to look at seeds. You don't have to look at flowers. You can also look at the stems. Monocots have stems that don't have rings of vascular tissue. Monocot stems just look like a mass of vascular tissue. Dicot stems have rings. So looking at the stem, do you see rings? Yes, dicot. Look at this stem. Do you see rings? No, I don't see any clear rings. I just see a mishmash of a bunch of different vascular tissue that makes the stem a monocot. Do I see rings? Yes, dicot. You can also look at the roots. Monocots have fibrous roots. Their roots are basically a bunch of strings versus dicots, which have one centralized root, what's known as a tap root. So looking at this, do you see one centralized root or a bunch of strings? Strings. That makes this a monocot. Looking at this plant, I see one centralized root. That makes that a dicot. Looking at the cactus, I see a bunch of different fibers. That makes that a monocot. You could also look at the veins and tell the differences between monocots and dicots. Monocots have parallel veins in their leaves. Dicots have branching veins in their leaves. So looking at this leaf, okay, I see parallel veins. Parallel veins belong to monocots. That would mean that their stems wouldn't have rings of vascular tissue. That would mean that their seeds wouldn't easily break into two. That would mean that they would produce flowers with petals in groups of three. Looking at this leaf, I see branching veins. That makes that not a monocot, but a dicot. That would mean that that seed of that organism breaks into two. That would mean its stem probably has rings. That would mean it produces petals in groups of four or five. That would mean it produces tap roots, not fibrous roots. Looking at this, I see parallel veins in the leaves, monocot. So one more time, monocots have one cotyledon versus dicots, which have two. Dicot, monocot, monocot. Leaves, monocots, parallel veins, versus dicot leaves, branch veins, dicot, monocot. Flowers, petals in groups of three for monocots, petals in groups of four or five for dicots. Monocot, five, dicot, one, two, three, four, five, and then the center one counts as another petal, that's six, monocot, one, two, three, four, five, six, monocot. Stems. Vascular tissue in rings. Sorry, in rings, monocot. Vascular tissue scattered throughout. I said that wrong. Vascular tissue in rings, dicot. There you go. Vascular tissue scattered throughout, monocot. And last but not least, roots. One solid taproot, dicot. Fibrous roots, 
Monica. So, what makes angiosperms unique? Not only flowers, but they produce fruits to carry their seeds. And both their flowers, targeted reproduction, and fruits to carry the seeds far away from their uh, 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 parent plants so the babies don't compete with the parents for fruit nutrients make them the most advanced reproductive organisms on Earth and allows them to become the most diverse group of organisms on Earth. How do botanists tell the difference between all these different plants? Well, there's a lot of ways, but in general, horticulturalists will divide them into two groups, monocots and dicots. And depending on their seeds, leaves, flowers, roots, and stems, you can tell the difference between monocots and dicots. That's it. Next class, we're going to take you all the way up until... The asteroid hitting the Earth, killing the dinosaurs, and in fact, the evolutionary evolution of humans. That's that.